I've entitled the message this morning, It Isn't Over Yet. And after last Sunday, and again, I want to thank everyone who was involved in, in everything that took place, all those that were involved in, in giving us a, a personal time with the disciples and to hear what their experiences were. I'd like to actually do that again, but, but I'd like to pick up from where they left off because I still have a lot more questions. And the service was great. I did want to ask them how, how did they deal with Jesus living with them literally for three and a half years and then all of a sudden he's gone and what becomes most real at that point is the circumstance at hand because there was certainly a lot that was taking place at Jerusalem or in Jerusalem at the time most of which revolved around getting rid of him and then finding um, a group of them huddled in a room somewhere and I'm sure at that point wondering, where do we go from here? We know what he said, but that doesn't seem quite as real as the present situation. I'm sure if they were wearing watches, which they weren't, obviously, not even the Apple watches. By the way, I don't have one, so... And then that's not meaning that you need to give me one, but I just, I just want to be careful. So. But realizing that something had been set in motion, that they were physically not able to see, but the word was moving. You see, when God speaks, he's not limited by our understanding and he's not limited by the circumstances that we may be looking at around us and even circumstances that we may feel in some way controls our lives because when that word comes the Bible tells us that it goes out and it does not return void So when Jesus spoke the things that he did, even before he was crucified, those words were suspended, if you will, apart from the control of any human intervention. And as much as they could believe that they could set the timetable for Jesus' death and to in their own words, proclaim it was finished when they got rid of him. What God had said, the clock had not stopped. And it was still ticking. It wasn't over yet. And when I see the fact that even in the natural, in the loss of a loved one, we are given the privilege certainly the instruction to grieve. Grief, or grieving I should say, is is a natural part of processing loss. And so I'm sure there may have been discussion in that room about the fact that, well, what do we do with what he said? And yet with all the turmoil that was going on around them, All they could think about was, he's gone. And then to put themselves in a frame of mind and try to put the pieces together of the things that he said. Have you ever walked with someone so long, I'm about to raise both of my hands, that sometimes when they talk, you don't hear them? Husbands, raise your hand. It's a good time for you to show yourself vulnerable. 
Okay, it sounds like some ladies are getting an opportunity to encourage their husbands. You didn't raise your hand, why didn't you do that? We're gonna have some conversation when you get home about your false humility. And I'm sure that they were doing all that they knew how to do and then finding themselves at the end of the day when the first day passes and then the second day passes, they're still living in the midst of their grief. How do you know that, Pastor? The Bible doesn't tell us that. But the Bible does tell us that they were human. And the Bible does tell us that there's a measure of shock that happens when loss occurs. We can see that in the life of Abraham. We can see that in the life of others who lost loved ones in Scripture. And yet when that third day came, when that third day came, the word that had been spoken before was now not only in motion, but down to the last detail of words that had been spoken 700 years before was now about to be fulfilled and hell could not stop it. Amen. Now at this point we ought to shake ourselves a little bit and say this is not really just preaching. God is trying to say something to me. So if your neighbor is trying to get your attention, just tell them, don't bother me right now. I'm not just listening, I'm focusing. Because sometimes you can think you're focusing, but if you're not listening, you're not focusing. But if you're not listening, you're not focusing. So, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a circle. And to find themselves in this place now, when they go to the tomb and they find out that he is not there. Whatever grief had found its way into their midst was now giving way to a joy. But I want to say too, to a reality. And the reality is this. If it is true what he said, that yes, you can destroy this temple, but on the third day it's going to rise again, and this is the third day, and he has risen, then how many of the other things that he has said to us does he also intend to bring to fulfillment? Which now, now it's taken out of the realm of it being mandated from heaven and now is put in the realm of we can choose to be part of it or choose not to be part of it. Do you know he did not strong arm any of the disciples and specifically the 12 that you're going to do what I tell you to do no matter what. But something happened. Something happened that moved them into a place that now they would say yes to things that before had scared them to death. When they were waiting in that room, assembled together, the environment around them was predominantly fear, not faith. You can read that in the scriptures. Fear of what? Fear of their life. But what God had said about them, and God was now going to pronounce through them, a power would begin to operate in them that they had not experienced before because before that, Jesus was doing it all. So I want to take you to Acts chapter 1 for a moment and we're going to review some verses that I trust are familiar to most of us.
Can you repeat with me, it isn't over yet. The writer, the Apostle Luke, begins, the former account I made, and he's referring to the gospel that bears his name, O Theophilus. The only thing that we know about Theophilus is he was some kind of a prominent person in the community. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. While we know that this book is introduced as the Acts of the Apostles, it is really the testimony of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And they got to be part of it because they said yes. Do you know that there were many disciples who enjoyed the provisions that, that was afforded to them through the ministry of Jesus, but at some point decided the cost is getting a little too great here. We're not going to hang around anymore. You can read that in John chapter 6. And you can see the discussion that went on. He ministered to thousands. But when it came down to what does this actually look like, when it became something that you had to respond to outside of your understanding, they just said, uh, adios. That's Spanish, by the way. <laughs> adios. We'll see you later. And he turns to his disciples. You can read that in John chapter 6 as well. And he says, are you going to leave too? To which they responded, how can we? How can we go? You are the one with the words of life. Most of them had words, but the power of their words many, many times was words that separated. Of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he hasn't stopped. And tell him too, you might not enjoy all that he's doing in you, but I am, because you need to change. Pastor, I'm not going to say that because I'm going to get in trouble. Jesus loves you the way you are, but he doesn't want to leave you that way. When the Bible says we're being changed from glory to glory, that is not from one level of your radiance to a greater level of your radiance. People will be more sick of you than they were when you had little radiance. That, that's not printed in, that's printed in my Bible, but probably not yours. Jesus hasn't stopped. Today, so many things want to tell us that Jesus is nothing more than a religious figure. So many things today want to tell us that you can't worship what you can't see. So many things want to tell us that the kingdom of God is, is an abstract reference to something that will come if and when this Jesus returns. I appreciated what Mary Ann said. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Began both to do and teach. He's raising up an administration suitable for the fullness of times, which is a reference to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, the New American Standard. In other words, within every time frame, 
or every frame of time, there must arise an administration that can deal with the situations and circumstances at hand. But for the kingdom of God, that, that administration has remained the same from the beginning. We see all the hand springs that the world is going through, but we don't have to join them. Amen. Of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day, say that with me, until the day. What does that mean? He kept on. He kept on. Why do you keep on? Well, pastor, I don't have anything else better to do. Relationally, that's really bad. You don't do it because you don't have another game. You do it because you're committed to the understanding that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And how many know we still need freedoms in our life that we're not experiencing to the fullness that God intended us to experience? And that is not because God doesn't know how to get it done in our lives. I think it's more clearly that we don't know how to release it or we refuse to release it because we think we're fine the way we are. Pastor, why are you on my case? I'm not on your case but God is on my case because I believe I want to be part of the administration that's going to walk the earth just like they did and begin to do the things that they did. And before you think that's just a display of signs and wonders, I'd like to ask you to look a little higher than that. Because when they got together and they started moving in the dynamic that God had placed in their life, literally the earth shook. They caused earthquakes. How many would like to be the starter of earthquakes instead of worrying about when the next one is going to come? Not earthquakes as in to destroy the neighbor you wish would have moved 20 years ago. Now you're going to move them because God hears your prayers. He kept on. One of the questions that I want to ask him when I get to heaven, I know the Bible says that our knowledge is going to be made perfect, so I'm sure as soon as we cross over into his presence, the need to have any answers at all is just going to pass away. But, but in my human understanding or intellect, there's a question I want to ask him. What exactly were you experiencing on the cross? For you to feel that at that point, your father, who you were with before, has now deserted you. When you knew the death you were going to die because you told your disciples. You knew the pain involved in personal suffering because that's what you gave your life to minister to. And how can you minister to something you have no understanding of? I didn't say the experience of, but the understanding of. How could that happen? What were you thinking? What was going through? And I believe this is the answer. It isn't over yet. Amen. Even though he said it was finished, there was something that had to be immovable Amen. in the minds and hearts of people that when everything else is shaking, there's a rock that they can stand on that is higher than themselves on which they cannot be moved. Because they're moved by their emotions. They're moved by those things that seem to be manageable. But there has to come this moment. 
until the day he kept on. Ever felt like giving up? Two honest people. Okay, let's try it again. Have you ever felt like giving up? Three minutes ago? Or I wish you would give up, Pastor, because you're, you're getting too close. I believe that these words are carefully articulated for a reason. I don't know how many times I've been through the scriptures and still have to guard my heart. That when I open my Bible afresh, that I don't read it in the framework of, I've read this before. Because it can be in the same way when you live with someone long enough and they speak, you really don't hear them. And if you have someone who is perceptive enough to see that, they will lovingly say, what was it I just said? <laughs> Christy, I think you need to come back up because we need a little salve to go over some of this. I don't want to labor long with this this morning because I don't know about you, I'm personally just a little raw from last Sunday. Raw in a good way. And as much as I know we saw the display created under Tom's leadership to be able to have an opportunity to set with the apostles, the disciples. Finding it easy to just see it as a production and miss the opportunity to engage with someone who's telling us, this is what I experienced with Jesus. Feeling a little raw because I, I look at this and I, I say, Lord, these are the things that you began to do and teach so, so I'd have hope. That you're not just one who's pointing the way. You know, we have a lot of pointers. We have a lot of pointers in the body of Christ. Well, you need to go that way. Yes, brother, thank you. You been that way? No, don't intend to. Well, then why are you wanting me to go that way? It's like giving. Oh yeah, we're supposed to tithe. Do you? I read a statistic in a Christian survey said out of 2,000 pastors that were surveyed, 15% tithed. 15%. Not in this house. Amen. Sad. Why would you even mention that? Because somewhere along the line, somebody's got to give up on understanding that the truth is the truth and God has designed it to set you free. And one of the major areas one of the major strongholds in our lives is money. And it can become a real dictator for people. It doesn't have to be. He, through the Holy Spirit, verse 2, he through the Holy Spirit. Do you know how critical those words are? It could have read, and he gave commandments to the apostles. He gave commandments. And I think grammatically it would have been okay to state it that way. 
But the reason why it states that through the Holy Spirit is down to the end, even before he was taken up into heaven, he said, I'm not going to give you principles only. I'm going to give you actions that you can follow. And the same Holy Spirit that raised me from the dead is now making himself available to you. And you, through the Holy Spirit, can do things that you could not do on your own. And I'm showing you that example to the end because I I need people who will be directed by the Spirit of God and not their own emotions and understandings because I need a new administration in 2015. I need a new administration that will rise up and say, this is the way, walk ye in it and reveal the kingdom of God. Reveal that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is not abstract. It is not something we hope for. And I'm living proof of a kingdom, of a kingdom that is overtaking every other kingdom. And I'll tell you something, if that battle does not occur in your life, make no mistake, a divided loyalty is still divided. And divided loyalties does not create unity. It does not create power. It creates division in the mind. And a person who's divided in their mind is not just bipolar. They're not schizophrenic. I think some of these things that we're looking at today is not a condition. And the world doesn't know what else to call it. You can go ahead and be seated. I think it's a government issue. And I'm not talking about our worldly government. It's a government issue. If I can read in my Bible in Matthew chapter 5 about a man that has more than 6,000 demons running his show to the point that he can't even keep himself from cutting himself, from crying, from walking about in the graveyard. And then Jesus shows up and with one word, he speaks to that man, that administration is gone and now the Bible says, there he sits clothed in his right mind. But do you know something? Do you know what had, not just what had been holding him back, but what hell was trying to keep him from accomplishing? Do you know God had ordained that man before he was ever in the tombs? God had ordained him to be an evangelist that would minister to 10 cities. But you can't fulfill God's purpose in your mind with two administrations operating in your life. But when God spoke the word, Jesus said, you're done. Not you, sir, but that which I see controlling your life, you're out of here. You've held this man long enough. Oh, by the way, I didn't go to him. He came to me. So where you think that you can run his life, it's only to a point, because when he starts pursuing me, hell cannot hold him back. Because the Bible says that he came running to Jesus. And the demons are not going to bring you to Jesus. Trust me. They want to keep you away from him. Why? Because he's the truth. And the truth will set you free. And so what happens? God says, for your life, sir. Gathering demoniac, that's how people identify you. Maybe they ought to stop. Maybe it should no longer be printed in the Bible. Maybe it should say, an evangelist in waiting. Well, I, 
I've just got problems. Okay? But you don't understand, Pastor. I really have problems. Okay, you really have problems. Do you like your problems? Pastor, are you serious? You're hurting my feelings. Of course I don't like problems. You want to give them up? No. Why not? Because if I don't have them running my life, what am I supposed to do? You know, the gathering demoniac didn't go from the tombs to the school of evangelism to the cities. He went from bound to free to proclaiming the message. That's how Jesus does it. He just makes you free. And then you learn how to minister freedom to others because you go to the freedom ministry school. Sorry. Sorry. He, through the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many hundreds of times I've read that. And I was hurrying to get to Acts 1.8 because that's where the show is, right? But you shall receive power. You got to understand that what leads up to that is a change in administration. You can't do it anymore. You can't do it anymore. Anybody tired yet of trying to do it? If you're not, wear yourself out. What's the old term? Knock yourself out. Because at some point, you're going to be six foot under or you're going to finally come to a place of saying uncle and saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't keep myself safe. I can't keep myself from harm. How many have seen the movie, Heaven is for Real? We just recorded it the other day and we watched it last night. This little boy has gone to heaven. Quit stumbling over the theological possibilities of that, for goodness sakes. It takes more faith to believe that it doesn't happen than it does to believe that it did. But when he was asked, how was it? So there's no fear. You're not afraid. And then he turns and says to his pastor, Dad, Dad, you don't have to be afraid. Everything's okay. What he doesn't say that it would have helped, maybe fill in the blanks, but then that's where people have to hear is, when you're under his administration, there's no fear. You don't have to be afraid. He, through the Holy Spirit. Pastor, you need to understand that the understanding I've been brought up with is that the Holy Spirit isn't it. If you have the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. Holy Spirit is more than a language teacher. Sorry. Because the Bible says when they started speaking in tongues, the ground shook. When they started speaking in tongues, governments started shaking when they walked in their midst. It isn't over yet. Because he, through the Holy Spirit, is still available to you and I. Pastor, how does that happen? How, how do you really get to that place? It's a simple word, sometimes hard to say, but it's simple. 
surrender. Pastor, can we play charades for a moment? Is surrender like give up, let go, let God? I think it's just easy not to do the charades. Lord, I surrender. I've had two kingdoms operating in my life and and one's leading me to hell. I want to tell you, you can be a Christian and be living in hell. And that's not because you're living with someone you don't want to live with. It's because you still want to live with two kingdoms running your life. He, through the Holy Spirit, gave commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Jeremiah 1.4 Before you were in your mother's womb I knew you. Before you knew what you knew or you knew what you thought you knew I knew who you were. And if you want to know who you are Don't be looking for man to define that for you. Because even after you're free, 2,000 years later, they'll still call you the Gadarene demoniac. But the neat thing about when Jesus comes and does what he does, he doesn't talk about your past anymore. He now talks about your future. Not about what could have been, but will be. Are you hearing me this morning? It isn't over yet. Pastor, I feel like I missed it. And? You didn't hear me, did you, Pastor? I'm telling you that I feel like I missed it. Do you want me to respond? Yes, I'd like to hear from you. The first problem is that it's your feelings that are guiding you. I feel that I've missed it. Get rid, not of your feelings as in annihilating them, because in order to do that, we got to kill you. And we're not really into that business. But if you want, I can help you. How do you do that? Simple prayer? Simple prayer. Is that corporate prayer or individual prayer? I don't care. Let's just pray right now. Okay, but tell me what you want me to pray first so I can decide if that's what I want to pray. No, 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 that isn't the way it works. He, through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to lead me to help you pray what you have been unwilling to pray for a long time. And now if you pray this through the Holy Spirit, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead is going to lift you out of that administration and put you under a new administration. You're going to be a new person and trust me, when you look in the mirror, you're even going to like it. And the neat part of it is the people around you who have been praying for you for years are going to love it. Are you happy? Are you happy? Yes. This is the word of God I'm giving you. I'm not doing all of these dances just to kind of do the aerobics that I've been missing for a while. Because I believe Every one of you here, we're supposed to be here this morning to hear this. And I believe every one of you are part of an administration that God is raising up Amen. for this particular hour. Amen. That are not tossed to and fro by all the nonsense that's going on in the world. So when everybody says, aren't you scared to death? No, actually, I'm scared alive. Because I have the fear of the Lord in my life. And something's happening in my life that I can't even begin to fathom that it would ever have been possible, but it's possible in Him.
don't ever listen to what the world says you are. Amen. Don't listen to that. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You can't stop the voices. You need to understand this. You cannot stop the voices. But you can stop the effect that the voices have on you by coming out of agreement with them. Because when the guy walked in to the Decapolis, the 10 cities, he didn't walk in saying, everybody, the Gadarene demoniac is here. How many want some demons? He walked in. Let me tell you about the power of God and what it did in my life and any of you that need it to happen in your life. All you have to do is say, I want it. it. You are part of the administration God is focusing on. Because if you'll hear what I'm saying, Hell, hell will be afraid to mention your name. Because you know, as soon as your name gets mentioned, it's like, hello, somebody's calling me. Dave, yes, I'm coming. What am I coming to? I don't know. I just heard, I can't. oh, you got demons. I'm, I'm just using Pastor Floyd as an example. <laughs> You got demons. I just unloaded 6,000. And uh, you like fellowshipping with yours? Are you ready to get rid of them? Okay, well, the same name, that same word set me free. I'm now going to mention the name and the word to you. And together we're going to walk in our freedoms. That's, That's the gospel. Well, I've not been trained... At Bible school. And he wasn't trained in evangelism school. He just told them what happened to him. You know, God didn't start him out with just one city. He gave him ten. Gee whiz. Well, that's a signal for me to stop. Can we stand together this morning? I trust this morning that you're ready to prophesy to yourself. Not to anybody else, but to yourself. Christy, you're ready to prophesy. You're ready to prophesy. Nancy, you're ready to prophesy. Colette, you're ready to prophesy. You're ready to prophesy to yourself. And that prophecy is, it's not over yet. But get the right kingdom in the right place. Get the kingdom of self and hell under your feet. Get the kingdom of God ruling over your thoughts and mind. Pastor, I can't stop the voices. You will never be able to stop the voices. I'm sorry. I'd like to tell you that you can. I've been trying to stop certain voices that plague me about 99,000 times a day. And I've worn myself out trying to get them to stop. And I just found that there's an easy way. I just don't listen anymore. Do they have the goods on me? They got more laundry than whoever does laundry has laundry. But that's not the issue. The voice I'm listening to is, it's not over yet. And he, through the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come into my life right now because I'm opening up doors that I've been afraid to open. And and this isn't a demonstration right now, saints. So 
if you'd like to take part in this, you can do the same, but I'm not forcing you. Notice my eyes are closed. I'm not watching you. But this is really a day. Some of you, this is your first time here. Don't get caught up in what it is you don't understand. Get caught up right now in the fact that you could have a dialogue with the person who has the power to set you free. His name is Jesus. And if you've never met him, that is invited him into your heart, do it right now. Just say, Jesus, I'm, I'm not going to just rehearse my past. It would take more time than, than the world has. I'm just saying, I've been not in the place I should be, and I need you in my life. Come. I've, I ask for forgiveness for my sins. And I want you to run my life. Your blood on the cross purchased that for me and I recognize it. Now I receive you into my life. Having said that, now Holy Spirit, I want to be all that you have created me to be. Just like the Gadarene demoniac who you had already seen him as an evangelist to ten cities because before he was in his mother's womb you knew him. His bondage, for however it came about, was keeping him from the purposes you had for him. But when he came running to you, you freed him. Lord, I want that freedom now. I want that in my life. Voices you can keep, you can make a symphony sound. You can, you can be a choir. But I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm listening through the Holy Spirit to what God has for my life. And that's where I'm going. You can come along if you want, but you're not going to be my guide. Father, we thank you for your freedom now. Saints, just let that freedom settle over you for a minute. Don't open your eyes. Say, God, I I'm, I'm just want to be silent for a minute. I receive what you're doing in my life right now, most of which I can't understand. But I'm prophesying over myself right now. It isn't over yet. I'm not ready for the trash heap. I'm not ready for the trash truck to stop at my house and beckon me, climb in. No, I'm listening to another voice. He, through the Holy Spirit, was giving and receiving commandments. And I receive those now so that I can go out and proclaim them to others. Father, thank you for the freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.